programming, gaming, fitness, Jesse Warden. What's up ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to talk about asynchronous programming, also known as async for short. You've heard a lot of different things about synchronous versus asynchronous, blocking versus callbacks, reactive programming, all that kind of stuff. The stuff that you're going to learn today is indicative of any asynchronous type of programming language. JavaScript does it. Sometimes Lua does it. A lot of other languages have different ways of entering async. Even older languages have got new async capabilities. So whatever you learn in JavaScript for async is applicable to any other language you go to. It just happens to be JavaScript is one that's used for the web a lot in GUI programming. And traditionally, GUI programming or front end building interfaces was not really known for doing asynchronous things. But it's very important. If I click on a button, I don't want the whole thing to freeze while I go to the internet to load some data, right? You can actually see a loading bar. You can do other things in Gmail while your email is being sent. If you're playing a video game, right? Characters can do some pathfinding and think while you can play with their inventory. So those kind of things are important to have. So what do I mean by async? There's only two words. There's synchronous and async. It's either happening every single time in order and align. Async is it happens at some random point in the future, very similar to events. So if you go look at my event video, we've already talked about this, but we'll get a refresher right now. So I'm going to wrap the um, console log function in D. So if we uh, want to, instead of typing console.log, we just go D. Yo. Right? It's just a simple way to debug. Okay? So we'll do that. So let's call our function 1. Let's say 1 was called, man. And so if we want to call 1, invoke it, 1 was called. Now we're starting into synchronous. So we're going to define another function called two. Say two is called yo. And do another one. Three. Three was called homie. So now we have one, two, and three. We have three functions called in a synchronous order, one after the other. If we go into our sources tab and click by on the numbers, you can set something called a breakpoint, and we can watch the call stack. It's where your functions call one another. They call another function, it's added to the stack. When they're done doing what they need to do, they're unwound from the stack, right? The stack is unwound. So when the function's done, it's off the stack. When the function's calling something, whatever it's calling, it's added to the stack, it's processed, removed. That's what we mean by call stack, because functions can call functions to call functions. So we're gonna step in, we're gonna go one. One is there, we have one that calls D, Right, so he's added the stack. We then have native code, right, which is scary. So we're going to hop out, step out of the current function. We can see that native code is done. It's on the last breakpoint. It's done with the function. I'm going to keep going. It unwinds D. It's gone from the stack. D's job is done. Wrapping console log is good to go. Funky Comedina. We're now done with one. So one's going to get off the stack. Now we have our anonymous function, which are, is basically our index HTML. Okay, calling our code. We're going to now go into two. Two is going to be out of the stack. He's going to call D right here and on down the chain. So we hit play, boom. So that's the concept of synchronous programming. Now, when we say synchronous, that things that take a long time, such as going to the internet or doing some pathfinding for a video game or anything that requires a significant amount of time, right? Even waiting on a user to click a button to do something. Those are what we mean by functions that take a long time happen asynchronously. They happen not immediate. So what does immediate mean? Well, let's look at the old school way of debugging JavaScript. You would have one and two, and then you would say something like alert. Yo, pause. Okay. So we know that if we have alert pause, we by looking at this code, we can identify one happens, then two, then alert, then three. Three cannot happen until alert is done. Alert cannot happen until two is done. That's synchronous thinking, right? That's traditional old school programming, which happens one after the other, very procedural. Okay. When you hear procedural, that's what it means in a procedure, one after the other. So when you load this, you'll notice that one and two is called, but the code is stopped. It's blocked from running. That's why I say blocked. It is paused. So this alert, we've paused the code. Three can't run until alert is done. Alert is actually not done until I click the OK button. As soon as I click OK, the alert function is unwound from the stack. And a off we go. We now have there was called homie. So as you can see, after the alert is done, the code execution continues. Now, imagine if alert 
every time you wanted to save a web form or you wanted to draw something to the screen or whatever, it blocked. So your other code wouldn't run. Sometimes your other code has to run to continue drawing things, right? I want to draw a box if you're doing things in Canvas or you're going to the internet to get some data to draw something dynamically. Imagine if that happened, your UI wouldn't be able to react because your code and your UI drawn in the same thread happen at the same time, right? So that's lame, right? We need some asynchronous way to say, go get some data. While you're doing that, I'm gonna go do something else. I'm gonna listen to mouse clicks. I'm gonna paint the screen. I'm gonna have my characters, my game update, whatever that is. So we have this thing called async. So if you remember set timeout, if you don't, Go take a review. Set timeout is a way to call an arbitrary function. In this case, we'll call it a non function. It's not really anonymous because it has a name, but that's okay. The anon was fired. McFly. So we're going to say call a non function after some arbitrary amount of time three seconds. 3,000 milliseconds is three seconds. If you don't like math, you can visualize it like this. Three times 1,000 is three seconds, okay? So after three seconds, call my function on one, two, three, and it'll fire out. An was fired, make fly. Okay, make sense? So that's set timeout. It doesn't happen immediately, but it does act like every other JavaScript and create its own stack. So for example, if we go in here and click the anon function and reload, after three seconds, our breakpoint will get hit and we can see that it's touched right there. We can step through and see how the non-function, he will call D, he'll add D to the stack, do some stuff, unwind them, and we'll go back to where we started, right? So if we add that with synchronous programming, we actually get multiple stacks. So check it out. We'll go one, two, three. Actually, we'll put two up here to make it, make it like it was before. So what you think would happen if you're an old school programmer, which is all good, is that one would fire, two would fire, this would fire after three seconds, and then this is fire. But that's not how it works. This actually creates a completely separate stack at some later point in time. So what we see on the console is actually gonna be one, two, three, and then three seconds later, a non-function, right? It seems weird at first, but you get it. If you think about spawning off, another, not another thread, but just another process, right? To go do stuff, okay? That's what it'll do. So if you reload, let's get rid of our breakpoint real quick, just so you can see it in action. You'll see one, two, and three were already called, and then a non fires three seconds later. So again, one, two, and three, call it immediately. Three seconds later, whoops, a non was fired. You get it? Cool. So that's the concept of a non stack. So if we actually go in our sources, you can do something kind of weird. So let's click on an index here. We'll set our breakpoint for two, and we'll also set our breakpoint for inside the anon function. So watch what happens when you reload. The code is paused. So all timers, all everything is paused because I put a breakpoint and said freeze guys. I wanna wanna debug this and show things, okay? So we can look at our console. One is already fired. Go back to sources. Our function is stuck in two. Two's on the call stack, it's being processed, and they paused everything because we want to debug it. We want to see what you know what's going down. So we step into it, we can see it's gonna call the log wrapper function I made. D's out of the stack. If you unwind it, go back, we can hit play again. And then it'll go to set timeout. Now watch what happens when we set timeout. It immediately runs it and goes next, right? It doesn't go in timeout because we said call it after three seconds. Even if we sat here and hit play, nothing would actually fire it for three seconds. Set timeout and other functions like set interval are known to call it the next stack or next tick of whenever your code is processed, okay? So anytime events happen, they might not show up on the screen immediately, right? But at some later point in time, it's gonna process everything that happens, right? So that's what we call the next tick or next opportunity to call a function and create a new stack. So we're in a stack right now, nothing's happening. We've got a kind of a pointer or, hey, call me later, fired. So we're gonna go in three, see the threes out of the stack. It then calls D and winds it and we're good to go. So we're gonna hit play and then count one, two, three, and then oh, what? Now we're in our function, right? Our non-function. So notice how it created a completely new stack. So we had that anonymous stack and it called one and two and D and unwound and kept calling and adding things. And then once anonymous was done, it run through all our code on line 35 and unwound. Then we created a completely separate new one three seconds later when our code called a non-function, right? Being the set timeout. So that's the concept of asynchronous. We can also pause the whole thing by doing an alert as well. Pause, right? And the thing about synchronous is that it always overrides 
anything in your code base, right? It'll pause everything. But we don't use alerts. We don't use kind of these synchronous pausing anymore. What we do is we want the user to interact with the UI. So if there's a button here, I couldn't click it because it's annoying alerts in the way, right? So I'm going to take out our breakpoints, which also sync things or pause things. These are good. These are good pauses. We like breakpoints. They help us debug our code. Unless you're, unless you're hardcore and you only use console log traces. That's cool too. If you remember back from events, we have one other async function. You remember what it was? Anything with keyboards, right? Async, events, clicks. Clicks are the same thing. We pass in a callback for something and say, hey, whenever the user at some random point in time calls this, create a separate stack. So we'll create a button called my button. Cow. And then down here, we'll go document dot get elements by ID. That means find this thing on my page called my button. I don't have a spell, Mr. Warden. And then we'll say add event listener to it. We're listening for the click event. So at some random point in time, whenever the user click, uh, it's a click button, please call the anon function. We'll call it the anon click. How about my click. How about that? That sounds great. My click. So we'll make a function called my click, which get it, gets an event, right? We'll say my click. So far, so good. Reload the page. We now have a cow button. If we click it, it'll call my click, and we can click it at some random point in time. Now, every time we do this, right, every time we do this, it's spawning its own call stack. So we can put a set of breakpoint there, click it, you'll see it has my click, right, which initialized this when I clicked the button, my click was then called. And when we process that, we step into it, it's gonna call D, right, add that to the stack. And then once she's done, unwind the stack and we're done. So you can click as many times as you want, it's gonna create its new stack, run through all the codes. If your button called the server and all this other stuff, process data would do it. But as soon as it does some asynchronous thing, it's gonna unwind the stack, its job here is done. Right, and then those asynchronous things will come back. So clicking a button's, button's asynchronous. If that button pushes data to the server, right, that's asynchronous. So you can have all kinds of asynchronous things. So that's why when people say reactive programming, right, they're using all these callbacks to react to all this random code that fires at random times. But it doesn't matter because you're like, oh, you want to click? I know how to handle that. Oh, you want some data returned from the server? I can handle that. So you do it with confidence. It sounds scary at first. It's not. As long as you know callbacks, you are good to go. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is asynchronous behavior. I hope it was helpful to get how basic this stuff really is, synchronous versus async. It's all about the callbacks. We'll get into promises and jQuery and HTTP later, but that should give you the basics to be equipped to handle the advanced stuff. Again, if you like my videos, please subscribe. And if you've got any comments, let me know on Twitter and the comments down below. You can email me. I'd love to help you out on your project if you've got any issues. I try to answer emails as fast as possible. So I hope that was helpful. Good luck.